Hello, Jim Rose here, and today we're going to be talking about a paper called Learning from How Flowers Bend Out of Shadows, and it's going to be deeply inspired by Javier Rivera, and it's going to be focusing on softening the object-subject divide, and uh, it's also going to orbit around this idea of pure experience from the book Religion and Nothingness, which is basically the stage before a child recognizes itself in the mirror, Lacan's mirror state, so it doesn't recognize itself as a subject. And it's a really interesting idea because often in philosophy there's looking for hypothetical situations or social contracts, say the veil of ignorance and roles, in order to justify a certain soci, um, socioeconomic order or a certain moral premise. But here you have a real experience that becomes the foundation of a new train of thought. And that's the real experience that all of us has gone through, which uh, probably none of us remember, but it's when there's a soft subject-object divide. And it also makes me think of, I guess, uh, the after fin finitude book by Quentin there, uh, on trying to correct correlationism. But anyway, um, where we have a strong sense that subjects and objects are different, then there's a sense in which we exist in the world as almost disworld is, is a word you could use to describe it. You know, you have disembodied. Uh, there's an accusation that Descartes made us all brains on sticks, so we're kind of disembodied and existentialists have tried to get us back to living full-bodied experiences. But there's, a, but there's a sense in which if there's a strong subject-object divide that we are disworld, we're just kind of not even in the world we're in. It's something other than us. Um, and, it, and it almost becomes when you have that hard subject-object divide, which is arguably a hangover of the Enlightenment, which was created because we need to quote-unquote be objective, um, you know, that we need to, uh, to, uh, to kind of be over the world as minds to give it meaning. But when you do that, the world becomes something foreign, and you don't really live in much of a connection to it. Uh, and that can lead to rationality being something that needs to domineer or subdue the world. Now, it's interesting because if we have like a theological tradition, which um, kind of says, you know, God created the world and maybe God lives in us, say, in Christianity, then, then there's some sort of, um, perhaps, revelation to be found in nature. Now, not all uh, the theologians agree with this. That gets into the whole image of God debate. But anyway, there's at least the possibility that the very fact that a flower bends out of shadow toward the sun says something about God or says something about his nature. And if it says something about God, since God also created us, then perhaps the way that a flower bends out of shadow also says something about what's best for us and who we are. However, if we have a strong subject-object divide, um, then there really isn't anything to learn from a flower bending out of shadow. It doesn't mean anything necessarily. It, it, we, we ourselves are not objects. We are just subjects. So what, what a flower does doesn't matter. The, uh, the way the wind blows doesn't matter. Sure, it can be, uh, it can be the sub substance of poetry, but poetry is just uh, becomes entertainment. And that's another thing. You have a strong subject-object divide. Art doesn't become really a source of wisdom. It just becomes something to enjoy. Um, and so it, it's important to weaken the subject-object divide so, in fact, uh, the world around us can have something to teach us as opposed to just be something that we need to give uh, meaning. And, 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 and also, uh, what's kind of interesting is that if we are totally other from the world because we're subjects and the world is object, well, there's this real skepticism against subjectivity, and yet we're locked in subjectivity. And so, you know, the world out there is something that we need to think about to give meaning, and it's totally other from us, and yet we can't even trust our own subjectivity because it's emotional or whatever, and it's subjective. So it's this very strange prison we end up locking ourselves in. Um, and, and it also gives rise to these problems, I guess, that Quentin talks about with Kant, where, you know, we're stuck in the phenomenon, and we can't cross the noumenon, we can't know things in themselves, so we can't get to the truth of things. Well, if we understand that we ourselves are actually objects, uh, I mean, we are in bodies, our, our brains are objects. Uh, maybe not the mind isn't an object, which could be an, an emergent factor of the brain, but we are in fact in objects. And therefore there would be reason to think that perhaps our subjectivity has been shaped by and influenced by objects. And if that is the case, then there would be reason to think that our thinking and perception and all these different things has something, um, has relation to the world outside of ourselves, that the world outside ourselves is not totally other, that we um, don't have to be disworld, uh, because in fact, uh, we can connect with it. And I do think Quentin and After Finitude makes very good points that, uh, that we do, unfortunately, really kind of find ourselves extremely skeptical of the ability to trust in thinking, because 
because thinking is formed by subjectivity, and that's kind of a uh, hangover of Kant. Um, I think also the paper's going to talk about how phenomenology is a very useful method, uh, that there that if we can weaken the subject-object divide, um, then, then it's going to bring back uh, phenomenology because th the fact that things unfold a certain way to us will perhaps say something meaningful about ourselves because we participate in that very world that is unfolding in front of us. Um, and, and so, and also too, if, if we are in fact um, somehow participating in objects, then there will be reason to think that objectivity to some degree is in fact possible for us um, because it is possible for us to participate in something outside of subjectivity. Uh, so anyway, the paper's going to get into a bunch of different topics, and it's also going to discuss the important thinking and perceiving divide um, that is discussed in the paper on thinking and perceiving, and also kind of say that oft it's really important to realize that many of the critiques about thinking being, uh, subjectivity being unreliable has to do with thinking, but Thinking is not all the brain does, it also perceives, which basically just means experiences. And even if we can't trust our thinking, there's very good reason to trust what we perceive. Um, I'm perceiving this computer right now, thoughtlessly, I'm not thinking about it. And the fact that it doesn't just randomly turn into butterflies gives me reason to think that it won't turn into butterflies, even if I can never be completely certain, if I can never ground my thinking by axioms uh, to be completely sure. Uh, in conclusion, the paper is going to say that what we really need to do is um, to get back to a state where we're really existing in harmony with the world, where we're not disworld, to keep using that phrase. I mean, often a lot of the West is, is about thinking. It's about individual fulfillment as opposed to, say, individual harmony. It's about figuring out how to solve our problems. Uh, it's about figuring out how to make the world into the image and likeness we want it to be in. So it's very thinking based. And then there's a paper called Deconstructing Common Like that talks about the problems of autonomous rationality. But if we really embrace this idea that we need to weaken the subject-object divide, then our thinking is going to perhaps switch from individual fulfillment to individual harmony, as, as was noted. And there is justified reason to do this, even on terms of thought, precisely because we all lived through a time of pure experience before the mirror stage. This is not all based on some vague uh, hypothetical social contract. This is actually grounded in a practical reality we all went through. So anyway, the paper has, says a lot more than that, but uh, just some thoughts here. For more, please visit ogrose.com. Uh, please subscribe to us on YouTube. That's a big help. Um, Twitter, you can find us Instagram. All likes, subscriptions are really appreciated, and thank you for your time.